let's stay very quickly with the autumn statement and just get a, a feel for what you both think is likely to be in there. Anand? Well, I mean, it's very hard to say because yeah. Rishi Sunak has become a past master at leaking potential measures. And so we've seen a raft of both tax increases and potential spending cuts being trailed to the media. What it's impossible to know from the outside is which of these will actually make it into the autumn statement uh, itself. Uh, so I wouldn't particularly like to hazard a guess. There does seem to be a fair amount of consensus amongst the news outlets that this social care cap is going to be delayed. So that's one way the government's... Well, I was going to say it's one way the government's going to save money. There are always two sides to these stories. Yeah. Remember, for every person who can't afford care, there are probably working age people looking after them because they can't afford their care, which means that, you know, there's a knock-on effect on the economy. So these things are all interlinked. I think it's wrong to see social care simply as a social issue. It's a huge economic issue as well. But yes, of course. Go ahead. Yeah, but just, just to say, I mean, I agree absolutely with Natasha that these two sort of agree on broadly the same, th same things with the economy. What will be interesting about having a former chancellor in number 10 is the degree to which Rishi Sunak continues to think he, and act as if he were the chancellor mm. and to limit uh, Jeremy Hunt in that way. When Gordon Brown became prime minister, famously, you know, Alistair Darling used to get a little bit frustrated by the fact that Gordon Brown forgot he was still wasn't the Chancellor and was still mm. sort of inordinately interested in what the Treasury did. So at that level, I think it will be interesting to see yeah. how suppose, they work together. I suppose that it's the issue of micromanaging as well, isn't it? OK, Anand, uh, front page of The Independent, more bad news, more pressure for the government. And uh, we're, we're talking about the possibility of strikes this winter. Yeah, and the, the story specifically is about the prospect of 100,000 civil servants uh, who voted to strike today, which can affect everything from flights to driving licences to how quickly you can get passports. Many people remember having long delays already for getting driving licences because of COVID. But this is the last in a long line of unions that are, have voted or are about to vote on strike action uh, this winter. Many people are making parallels to the so-called winter of discontent in the 1970s. And next week, I believe the Trade Union Congress is going to host talks amongst different unions about coordinating this action. And this is something the government's got to be very wary about because, you know, it'll, the unions will be keeping, particularly the public sector unions, will be keeping a close eye on this autumn statement next week. And if they don't get what they want when it comes to pay, then it's going to perhaps induce a few more of them to come out on strike and make life even tougher for the government and indeed for us. Yeah, not quite, not quite what a, a new administration wants to be dealing with, Natasha. Uh, demonstrations by climate activists, who I think for three or four days in a row have managed to block the M25 by uh, sitting on these gantries over the motorway, which leads to the motorway being closed, and the police are being accused of not being tough enough with them. Now, a senior police officer has said you can't arrest your way out of these protests, which has left a lot of people thinking, well, what are you going to do then? Because at the moment, what you're getting is profound disruption, and there's clearly no clarity about what the police should be doing or how far they should be going. We had a story the other day about a journalist being arrested for doing their job and yet at the same time we see the protesters, many of whom have been picked up by the police at previous protests simply to be allowed to go free and then come back and protest a couple of days later and you know this is becoming a real source of public irritation I think for particularly people who are caught in these enormous queues as a result of this action. So Natasha I don't know about you and we're going to another sports story actually it's the same story we had in the half ten but a different take on it we're learning a bit more detail about how he heard that he had been called up uh, and I don't know if you want to explain to the viewers. I mean, yeah, it's a curious story, this, because if I was a, f a fantastically talented footballer and I thought I was about to be selected for the World Cup, I'd have my mobile phone glued to me. Uh, and this is a story about James Madison, who got the call from Gareth Southgate that he was called up, but missed the call, uh, and then had a panic that he was being called to tell him that he wasn't going to be in the squad. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, I just, I, I just find it hard to fathom why he would let his phone leave his side. He should have taken it out to training with him if he was expecting that call, quite frankly. Do you think he, he guessed that he was going to be, you know, he was in the running for it? Well, I think. Go on, Natasha. Um, I, I think Natasha's passing on sports. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I'll defer to the expert here. <laughs>
I think it depends what sort of character you are, I suppose. I mean, I'd always assume the worst, but, you know, other people might be a lot more positive in spirit than I am. But you'd certainly not want to sit and stare at that missed call and think, oh, my God, I better ring him back. But what if it's bad news? I mean, you're far better off getting the call mm. in the first place. I think. Uh, anyway, um, good news all round, uh, actually. So 11 days till till the World Cup uh, kick off in Qatar. Front page of the Metro now. Natasha, uh, um, uh, just looking at this, do you, do you really think that he wants to continue in his political life after this? Do you, do you see this is where, he's, where it's going? I mean, my, my hunch when I heard he was going on was that this was a case of one last paycheck while I can to make the most of it before I stopped being an MP. I'd have thought Matt Hancock would have assumed, having done this, there would be some sort of backlash. I would have assumed, therefore, that he thinks his political career is effectively over. Uh, and hence, he, or, or he's at least willing to tolerate the possibility that his uh, career is over. But there is an interesting yeah. side question here, isn't there? You know, Boris Johnson famously was on a beach in the Dominican Republic before he flew back for the second leadership contest. That was while Parliament was sitting. Uh, we hear about other MPs who are off on their second jobs while Parliament is sitting. And it, it, it is striking that there aren't any rules around this because they do quite an important job and it you know mm. and it, it is amazing how there doesn't seem to be any sort of norms about how often they're expected to turn up mm. covid and the pandemic was provided proof of concept really that you know people were still productive at home and and well it did for some people in some jobs i mean mm. i'd say the jury is still out and you'll hear you know, bosses disagreeing vehemently about this. Uh, the previous boss at Twitter said, you know, you can work at home forever uh, and clearly thought that that was good for productivity. Elon Musk has come in and clearly thinks that actually he needs to have people in the office. I suspect the truth lies somewhere in between and hinges mm. crucially on the sort of work you do. I mean, some people, you know, interact a lot with other people at work. It's a real team atmosphere and they probably need to see each other a little bit. If you do more solitary kind of work it might be all right working from home but i think yeah. it's a horses for courses sort of situation but we're far from we're far from reaching a post-covid equilibrium i think i think yeah. we're still gripping our way somewhat towards what new normal really means indeed indeed yeah we're not through it yet um professor anna menon and natasha clark to both of you thank you very much indeed thank you